I'm excited to introduce our next folks. Um, so as you all know, um, a lot of you are national reporters, but some of you have you know, specific states you're focused on. Um, even if you are not focused on a specific state, there are times where one is going to, something's gonna happen and one is going to rise to national importance. Um, to say that's happened in Georgia is like an understatement. There's so much that's been going on there. Um, and so uh, these folks are going to talk about um, a, the political implications of everything that's happened in Georgia specifically, but also I hope that it is useful to think about how you would cover either the state that you're assigned to cover or the next time that happens um, for other states that you might have to jump on. Um, so we have Matt Brown. Matt was a uh, Paul Miller Fellow last year. He is the democracy reporter for the Washington Post, which is actually a new beat. So he can also probably talk about what it's like to define uh, a new beat, um, which is always an, a kind of exciting, um, but some, certainly sometimes challenging um, position to be in. Um, and we have Lali Ibsa, um, who is a congressional reporter for ABC News. Um, and so although Georgia is not in either of their titles, they've both been there quite a bit. Um, so please join me in welcoming them. I'm Laylee. Uh, I now work up on Capitol Hill uh, for ABC News, but previously I was a midterm embed based in Georgia. Um, and it was our first time doing midterm embeds for ABC News. It was a really cool experience for me. Um, personally, I'm from Florida, so being back in Southern politics was something that I was really looking forward to. I don't know if anyone's from the South here, but that, yeah, okay, yeah, so you, oh, okay, from Florida, nice. Okay, great, so you kind of understand. There's like a lot of cool dynamics that happen in the South where there's a really interesting intersection between politics and culture, um, especially in Georgia. And I think that that's something that as reporters is something that we kind of all covering Georgia lean into is that intersection. Um, I went to school in California. So the political dynamics from a state like Florida to a state like California were wildly different, but I worked in local news um, in California. So being in Georgia and being an embed base there kind of brought me back to my local roots, which I think is super cool. Uh, but when we think about Georgia, I think that something that's so important is remembering the human angle of it all. So right, if we talk about the Trump investigation, like a huge part of that is how people are impacted by Trumpism in the state of Georgia. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, we cover the implications and the political investigations of Trump and what all that means. And it's important to cover the charges or possible charges that could happen um, and what that means if he's indicted and Trump is a candidate who continues to run. But I think that another part of the story is actually the people that have been impacted by his rhetoric, by his efforts to overturn the 2020 election. Matt can speak to this as well, but like we've both talk and talked to poll workers, we've talked to election officials that receive threats now that don't want to work because of the rhetoric that's happened since 2020. I also think that we can look to the midterms and see how, you know, Trump continues to kind of lose in a state like Georgia and like you ask why and I think that a big part of it like goes back to 2020 and Trump trying to you know potentially overturn the election results or say you know find me the votes to Raffensperger Republicans have used it and you know like someone like Raffensperger and Governor Brian Kemp have used that infamous phone call um, between Trump and the Secretary of State's office to kind of talk about the ways in which they have protected democracy and protected election integrity, right? And so I think that it all kind of boils down to the context of the state of Georgia. Um, and because like, you know, it, like I said, it's like important to cover the political aspect, but the human angle of it all and the culture angle of it all is like just as much as like the part of the story as like the political angle of it all. And so when you're looking for ways, especially like I was like a local, I felt like a local reporter being an embed, but I'm also working for a network. So, you know, how do you, all politics is local, but how do you make a local story national, right? And how do you pitch it to a network? You find characters, right? So you find people like poll workers, like election officials who 
who can talk to you about the larger part of the story, right? You like take someone like um, Lindsey Graham, for example, right? He testified in front of the grand jury and then immediately he went to go campaign with Herschel Walker. What does that say about Herschel Walker's campaign, right? And the angle that he's taken and, you know, while Trump didn't go to Georgia during the midterms, he still had a lot of people that his allies come to Georgia and campaign with Herschel Walker. So, you know, while he wasn't in the forefront, right, there were still so much parts of Trump that were embedded in Herschel Walker's campaign. So, you know, kind of taking the context of, okay, I'm not going to pitch this story that's just on Lindsey Graham testifying in front of the grand jury. I'm going to take a step back and realize the context of it all that this investigation plays in the politics of Georgia. Um, what else can I say? Um, yeah, I, I, mean, I mean, I think that like also it's important to remember like when we talk about voting rights and we talk about elections, like Georgia is the heart, like the heartbeat of Georgia's voting rights. So, you know, uh, the memory of John Lewis is very prominent in Georgia, especially when you talk about the Democratic Party in Georgia. You know, voting rights is so crucial for that state and it's so crucial for so many people because they have a personal connection to the history and the story of voting rights. And so, you know, that's something that can't be overlooked when we talk about Georgia come 2024. So, you know, for me, I was like embedded in a state, right? For some people who are looking for to 2024, you could be embedded in a candidate and maybe, you know, they have a stop in Georgia, like going to, you know, Ebenezer Baptist Church and like talking to people around the church and talking to people in the Sweet Auburn district is something that where you can find so many different storylines from people. And like, that's a way that I feel like as a journalist in that state, you can really, you know, stand out because you're talking to people that have real connections and real storylines and like you can sort of interweave that way. So yeah, I think we, we talk about politics a lot and we talk about, you know, I work up on the Hill, we talk about the access that you get to politicians. Well, when you're going and covering a state or covering a candidate, the access that you have to people is also just like, amazing and i think that the ability to like continue to just talk to people but not about like going up to them and asking them about the trump investigation right or asking them about their candidate that you know they're there to support but just like asking people generic questions and general questions and like how do you feel that georgia's had this national spotlight you know for a lot of people that was a question that i used to ask them a lot is like how does it feel for you who's like lived in this state you know some born in this state and now you know you're being asked Asked all these questions by people like us with reporters and cameras and we're sticking mics in your face and for a lot of them you know there's a sense of pride that like their state is having this national attention and focus on this state but there's also like this level of like humility of I'm a regular person and like every vote matters and it kind of just like emphasizes that point so I think that Georgia has a lot of different political trends that are interesting but the narrative and like the personal narrative of the state is something that um, is really, really interesting and something that I think in 24 will be explored a lot. And I, I recommend all of you <laughs> go down to the state and travel it because um, from Atlanta and the way that people have just kind of bustled into that state and then you go uh, to urban areas and rural areas and you talk to, you know, farmers and the ways in which that they have, you know, sort of leaned in a more moderate way in the the trends, the political trends, because so many people have migrated into that state um, is really, really interesting. Um, but yeah, that's my Georgia spiel. Um, if any of you guys have pointed questions, happy to take them after I hand it over to Matt. And I just wanted to share, because I don't think I sent you all the agenda for the day, so I apologize, but we are having a session specifically on voting rights. Okay. I mean, not specific to Georgia, but across later today. So just an FYI. <laughs> Hey everyone, my name is Matt. Um, over the past year, I was back in Georgia where I actually grew up. I really try to tell the story of this state that I've been, you know, in love with and obsessed with for such a long time to especially discuss, you know, when it comes to questions of democracy. This is not necessarily a discussion that we've, we've been having it in Georgia for a very long time. You know, obviously it was, um, you know, the epicenter of the civil rights movement in a lot of ways. You know, Atlanta has long been the city too busy to hate. And really trying to discuss and balance that history and the fact that so many people still feel that and still feel that those debates are still happening in a lot of ways alongside our current national discussions over immediate threats to democracy, acute threats to democracy, political polarization, election denialism. Do people have access? Um, do people have access? The ballot. How are how are policies changing? What are 
on the ground doing to either you know expand the electorate, shrink the electorate, you know, voter challenges, um, voter registration drives. Like these were the things that I was really looking at, just on like the bread and butter, kind of following the beat. Then you know. Subsequently, also, there was a lot of like men paying attention to what the campaigns were doing. For instance, during the runoffs, there was a lot of lawsuits and litigation over what different counties were able to, you know, do, whether they were going to have Sunday voting or not. And the parties were really engaged in the process. So it wasn't just engaging with election directors and seeing, okay, well, the law's on the book. What does the law actually mean when it's in practice? It was also, we've got people who are partisan actors who are now actively trying to influence like how the voting is going to take down. So a lot of my reporting was very let's just get to the brass tacks of like what does this actually mean for people um and in that pot and in that process you know when you really get into like you know the weeds of election policy and trying to make it tangible and interesting to people because obviously this is stuff that ultimately people when you know joe biden is like the soul of america and donald Trump is like you know we need to you know restore america and all this stuff like people are it it, it ends in you know basic election policy <laughs> implemented by these local election directors on and whatnot, who obviously over the past couple years have, you know, gotten a huge national spotlight because we've really realized that the basic machinery of democracy is oftentimes what is under discussion when you look at, for instance, the 2020 election and all of the disputes that happened after that. So really meeting those people, getting to hear their stories, um, learning who's left the office, what institutional knowledge that leaves, who's come into the office, what new energy that brings. Like these were a lot of the questions that and stories that I was super excited to tell while I was like going around this, you know, big state, which is, you know, as someone like from Georgia, like Georgia is as big as New England. I just need to like express to people when it's like when you're when you're a campaign in bed and you're like driving around the whole oh, yeah. state, like it is like four hours any direction. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, so many different types of places that you can be going to. So um, that was also just like a really, you know, exhilarating thing of mm -hmm. just really zeroing in on, you know, following the candidates around. You know, my questions were always very like, like, OK, but what are you doing about, you know, this lawsuit? Like, where are your people turning? You're turning out here and everything um, that culminated. I got to moderate one debate that was super exciting um, for the secretary of state race, um, which was also interesting because mm -hmm. as we just as um, we discussed, Brad, Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger obviously resisted Trump's overtures to overturn the 2020 election. So it was a very interesting reality to a start asking him questions during this debate of kind of like, well, here's the brass tacks of election policy. And I know that there's a lot of like national discussion of your profile and everything, but there's people in Georgia who have questions. So yeah. trying to balance that, I am working for a national news outlet, but I'm in a local place and there's local people who want to have and who want to have questions for their statewide leader was something also that was difficult to balance. And then obviously there's Trump investigation. So, you know, questions over when are, how is this investigation being conducted? Who is the district attorney? I mean, as someone who grew up in Fulton mm -hmm. County, it was very interesting to, you know, have friends and family who had very personal opinions on the cases that, um, District Attorney Fonnie Willis was bringing up, not just because, oh, she's, you know, currently investigating Donald Trump as his allies, but also like, you know, there are other, the, the question of there are other cases that can be prosecuted here that you could be spending your time and resources in a different way was, it's a talking point in national media, but it's a very real question yeah. for like people on the ground, balancing the national focus of, of the weightiness of investigating a former president for potential wrongdoing was, you know, obviously the huge and major story but there was also all of these other questions around kind of the district attorney's office and everything like what her work is what how she carries out this work when which i discovered she's even though she's not from atlanta she's profoundly atlanta like, yeah. <laughs> in the way that she's conducted this whole thing and the way that the case has been carried out i think that the country's gotten kind of a you know crash course experience in how the city of atlanta conceives of itself thinks about itself and carries its business like you know, very, very audacious. So, um, and I think that that has also been something that just in general, I've really enjoyed is just being able to, you know, again, tell the story of a place that I really care about and have thought about for a long time um, to a national audience and trying to make sure that the stories of the people on the ground not just make sense to a national audience, but also make sense to them and that they can see themselves. Um, hi, I'm Naomi with the Washington Examiner. I'm really curious again about this 2021 voting law um, because, I mean, it was sort of a very highly politicized, as you said, but then afterward, voting numbers were up. And so a lot of Republican talking points were sort of like, oh, this is just proof that this was democratic hysteria, et cetera. But I'm wondering from your reporting on the ground, was it sort of the case because we were talking about it so much, it kind of elevated voting in 
in a way. Like I would just be curious when you were talking to people in Sweet Auburn, what were they kind of saying about that? Yeah, you know, I think that the law got a lot of attention nationally, but I do think that there was, you know, a focus of it locally on the ground as well. Like you can't turn a street corner without it during an election time without seeing a voting rights group like out, you know, canvassing, campaigning. And it's not just Democrats too, like Republicans, especially this election cycle, have upped their ground game. Governor Brian Kemp's, you know, campaign is a really good example of that. And then you talk about, you know, uh, the water and the treats not being kind of out there. Like that was definitely discourse that was happening. I think that you look at, I looked more so to the runoff as like where we saw more election challenges that, you know, Matt was talking about in terms of Saturday voting. There was a debate on whether or not um, Saturday voting should be allowed in the runoff. You know, it's it got in the weeds of like, you know, was it allowed um, in the state or not? Um, and Democrats had really pushed for Saturday voting to be allowed. I think that my overall takeaway from the election laws that were enacted is that Georgians are resistant, resi resi resilient. They're resilient. Georgians are resilient. Um, and so for them, for it was a catalyst, right? So when that law was enacted, it was a catalyst to show up to the polls. When we talked about Saturday voting, right, Republicans were saying that Saturday voting wasn't wasn't to be allowed. Herschel Walker was saying that they shouldn't allow Saturday voting to happen, whereas like Senator Warnock, like really his campaign and Democrats led the charge to allow Saturday voting. So it became this discourse of Republicans are trying to disenfranchise your vote. Democrats are trying to give you, you know, all this opportunity. And then we saw like really long lines happen um, in Saturday voting. I think that's a culmination of a lot of things, but I do think that, you know, the law was getting a lot of attention locally on the ground, but not in the sense of like the in the weeds, like Stacey Abrams had campaigned on it a lot, but Senator Warnock had kind of just like taken the overall message of, you know, um, voting rights and allowing everyone to have the ability to vote. But Georgians, like I remember like that Saturday, like the lines in especially like in Fulton County was like in a library it was like down the road, like across the street. And so many people were saying like there was this rhetoric of they tried to block me from voting. Right. So like I this was like my like protest. This is my way of showing up like I could have showed up any other day. Right. Um, but I wanted to show up this Saturday because they didn't want me to vote on this Saturday. Yeah, I think those are all really good points. And um, an interesting point, political point that I noticed during the campaign with, with Warnock versus Abrams is Abrams talked a lot yeah. about voting rights all throughout it. Um, Warnock didn't really talk about voting rights on the trail, but the, at his victory party, the first thing out of his mouth was that voter suppression is real. So I thought that that was a very interesting just political dynamic that he had where he wasn't, he's like, I'm not right. going to like wade fully, fully throat it into this until... I've won six more years and then right. suddenly and then I will you know, <laughs> endorse, all endorse it yeah. all in. Yeah. Um, no, I think that there's two parts to this. So first, um, I think going back to 2021, it's important to remember how the law was put together because I think that a lot of that affected the national discourse around it. The law was put together very much kind of like scrambling last minute right at the end of the session, which is how a lot of laws in Georgia and across yeah. the country are made in states. But I think that because when the law was first unveiled and first pushed out um, of committee, it was much, much more dra dra draconian, quite frankly, yeah, than, than even what came out. For instance, it would be banning Sunday voting. It would have... Um, you know, just a whole bevy of restrictions that then when a national pushback then happened, um, a lot of that stuff was then stripped out. So a lot of the discourse around what was actually going to be in the law wasn't actually about what actually passed, yeah. even though, you know, the motion, the movement, um, you know, by Delta and the, and the all star game and all of that stuff was still happening, even though the law had changed a bit. Then getting into the actual weeds of what did the law change in effect. I do think that we saw very clear effects of the law, for instance, and I do actually think in its own way that the early voting numbers do show that, for instance, where a lot of what the law did was focusing on absentee ballots and early voting, for instance. So it made it so that it was there were a lot more steps, for instance, for registering to vote for an absentee, for registering to vote and then registering to apply for an absentee ballot and then receiving an absentee ballot and then filing an absentee ballot. So, you know, for instance, you know, with drop boxes, they in Georgia, rather than, you know, get rid of all of them, they're now, you know, reduce the number of them that are allowed per county. They all have to be with a voting cent in with a voting center under 24 hour surveillance with a guard and only accessible from nine to five. 
at a polling place. So you might as well vote early if that's the situation for a Dropbox anyway, which makes it so that a lot of people were basically, a lot of people basically realized that, well, I'm very engaged to vote. I want to turn out in this election and everything. Um, a, some of the avenues that have been historically, Georgia was never a particularly strong, like, like it wasn't like Utah or Wyoming where like, you know, early, early voting by mail was a very Straight common up. thing. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, that avenue was very largely closed off in a lot of ways. And you did see those numbers crash. But you saw also, and I think this is where it's important to really get into questions of how do you disaggregate um, what are the factors going on in a state where Georgia is a highly polarized state? It's a highly politically engaged state. It's a state where a lot of national money, attention, and local energy are to turn people out. How do you disaggregate that from the fact that the laws have changed a bit in how people vote, for instance? So I think that that's why you saw a lot of long lines in early voting, because there were more logistical policies around what counties could and couldn't do in preparation for that they that they that is not necessarily true on election day, for instance, on what they, on how they can, you know, share ballots and um, where people can vote and everything. Right. But you also have an incredibly engaged electorate that still wants to turn out and everything. So the question of what is the effect of the law? Is it Jim Crow 2.0? Is that a fair talking point? Did voting shoot through the roof? In the end, basically turnout was, you know, about what you would expect for a midterm. It's just that Georgia is now an early voting state where when you have a lot of people who are super engaged to vote, right. they want to vote and they don't have a lot of avenues, they're going to turn out early, but there's only one, you know, if there's only like, you know, one or two high, especially in places like Fulton, Fulton DeKalb, yeah. Gwinnett, the big counties in Georgia, when there's only a couple places that people know to vote at, even if you can vote at every single polling place in the right. county, it is, you know, that's why you end up with like three hour, four hour long lines in some places. Like I waited in a two and a half hour long line actually yeah. to vote, you know? So so there are, that I think is the the question around the law and everything and why it's gotten so fraught and difficult to discuss in a lot of ways. And I think a lot of the other provisions actually um, in the law, for instance, I, I did a story on the Fulton County Performance Review and how a big part of that law made it so that the Secretary of State is no longer the head of the election board in Georgia. They appoint the state legislature then appoints the head of the election board. And consequently then states are the state is then allowed to do a performance review of counties that they think are underperforming, which may then result in a takeover of the county. So that is like a that is a provision of the election process down there that I don't think got as much attention when people were saying, oh, my God, like, you know, they're banning water, water and food from yeah. being passed out. There's there's, you know, all of these very graphic images that we're going to be seeing from the effects of this law. But, you know, the actual question of. Is this, is this county of one million people, one tenth of the state, actually going to be able to administer its own elections mm -hmm. was something that then was in effect of the law that didn't get a lot of attention until actually not because a review was conducted, but because it became very clear that the review's process was not actually worked out. So when I say that so much of this stuff happens, lives or dies in election policy, like if you just because you write a law about it and you say, well, the state legislature can do a performance review and that, and the, the performance review will be carried out by the state election board. It's like, well, who's going to carry out the review? Who are the people who are going to do this? Oh, you want election directors from other counties to do it? Okay, well, they've got to run their own elections. Mm -hmm. So how do they go and then take the time to go and review in other counties' elections? How do, how, do we, how do we have the time to interview these people? You only want three people to do this? Which, which actually, you know, the Carter Center had to come in and like, you know, basically do the entire, you know, second half of the review or at least verify the work of it because, you know, policy actually happens on the ground. Policy happens when it's carried out and stuff. And a lot of the story to me of the 2021 election law, and I obviously think about this entirely too much, was um, <laughs> was um, really in how well conceived were the actual policies in it. Um, so much of it was created in this kind of heat of the moment political debate yeah. that I don't necessarily, and now so many questions from election directors that I hear from, you know, folks on the ground and their voting experience and even just from lawmakers say like, OK, well, you know, even if we have a certain spirit or vision of this law, like how do we make it workable for what the vision is, whether it's conservative or liberal? And those are the debates that are actually happening right now as we speak in the Georgia legislature. And I'm obviously paying very close attention to that. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Kirsten. I work for Cox Media Group, and one of our stations is WSB in Atlanta. So, woot woot, yeah. Channel 2 Action News, what's up? Um, uh, you know, what can I say? Local thing. Um, but I, we obviously are following Georgia, but we follow other states. I'm curious to think, with South Carolina now being elevated to one of the earlier primaries, at least for the Democrats, how could that maybe impact 
Georgia's elevation for 2024, but also what are your thoughts on how that 2021 law will be tested in 24, since that's the first presidential election that we'll see for actually a lot of states. They're going to have their new laws really tested next year. So kind of twofold. Okay, so first on South Carolina being, you know, elevated, I think that, you know, right now there's a lot of debate over whether the DNC is going to have their, um, you know, annual or their 2024 convention in Atlanta. So I think that there's just a general interest, it seems, um, you know, from Biden world and the Democrats more broadly, that they want to elevate the South as a place where politics happens, which I mean, just honestly, if you just look at the demographics of the country, it's something like one in four members of Congress are going to be from the South in like a decade. So like like the, the, the country is trending towards the Southeast and Southwest. So it just makes sense from just a hard political calculus that this is where you would want to try and, you know, cultivate people, like make the political machinery happen. Um, I think that insofar as, you know, South Carolina politics are, you know, it's always been a, you know, early state that's engaged a lot of people and everything. I do think that there are folks who, even though Georgia and South Carolina are obviously different places, it, it, they are more similar than, for instance, trying to do politics in Michigan or trying to do politics in California. So I think that having just more politicos and hopefully reporters who get Southern politics, um, I do think would is going to make it so that Georgia, as the you know now premier swing swing state, I guess right. in the Southeast, yeah. is going to be a lot more of a you know place people want to discuss. I'm sorry, your second question was. Um, so um, I know, obviously, the 2020, 2021 law that you guys just talked about. Yeah, the midterms were obviously a good first kind of like, what does this look like? What are people doing? And as you mentioned, like midterm numbers were as a midterm would be. But 2024, you know, what do you kind of what are you looking for? How do you think that law might play out, you know, then or just what? Because obviously none of us are like future tellers. But, you know, I guess what are you looking for knowing that's going to be a bigger test? And again, with the South being elevated more on a national stage. Right. Well, I, w I will be looking for first whether or not the laws are going to change before then, because they do have time to, to actually, you know, affect what is going to be passed when people are obviously having lots of conversations about that right now. Um, you know, questions about runoffs, for instance, that's not going to be an issue in 2024. Right. So um, I don't think that like those types of Georgia election policies are going to be impacted. But I do think there is an interesting question of both the narrative around voting rights, voter suppression, election security, how that's going to play out politically in relationship to the law. So because so many people, for, so because so many of these groups, for instance, have really constructed their identities either around, we are going to find as much fraud as humanly possible and do this many challenges. If that is an animating force on the on parts of the right again in 2024, you could see that play a lot more of an effect in Georgia. And because of the changes in laws, you know, you could see that become more of a burden for election for counties as they try to like navigate through what's already going to be a highly polarizing and very well watched um, 2024 presidential cycle. On the other side, all these activist groups that we're talking about that are saying that they're you know trying to enfranchise people, get out into the streets and, and really mobilize folks. Are they because of you know certain bans on what they can do too is another part of what the um, 2021 election law did. Are they going to have as many resources, as much attention if they can't, for instance, you know, pass out food and water to people, if they can't um, help everyone with every single aspect of their voter registration? Like that was really some of the secret sauce of what made a lot of these groups so engaged, because you can have an incredibly engaged um, citizenry, you can have a very polarized citizenry that wants to vote. Um, but you, the question there for a lot of these groups is how do we get the marginal voter to come out? And it was, and one of the things that the law did is that it made it a lot harder for third party people to come in and say, we're going to, um, you know, register this many people. Don't worry, we'll take your absentee ballot and we can like, you know, file it for you. You can drop off the absentee ballot anywhere right. you'd like. Just a lot of those like really marginal tweaks that made those groups that everyone credits with 2020. Um, if they can't do the work that they want to do, then like who's going to do that work or how are they going to change that work? So I think that's going to be what is going to be something interesting looking at 2024. On the South Carolina and Georgia thing, right? I think that the national attention that Georgia is kind of getting when we talk about, you know, Atlanta, hosting potentially the DNC and, you know, the early primary window and even Raffensperger himself endorsing it. But, you know, later on, not for 24, but that's still like just like understanding that even Republicans and Democrats are talking about, you know, um, 
putting it earlier in that primary calendar is just kind of one like an ode to what Georgia has delivered, but also in the sense of, you know, Georgia's interesting political dynamic and the way that, you know, uh, Senator Warnock won, right, the Senate seat, but then you had Brian Kemp when the governorship and then also like every statewide office so it was also elected um went down the ballot pretty much republican you know that interesting dynamic and understanding that like having a candidate come to a state like georgia early and like have that face time because georgia has kind of cemented itself as this you know i always see like candidate state right where like georgians really care about hearing from a candidate and like what a candidate is willing to do to reach across the aisle so i think that having it in an early primary window for both parties can be seen as something that um it can be beneficial because of the ways that um Georgians, like we always talk, about, especially in the midterms, like the split ticket voters, right? The, but split ticket voters were really real and split ticket voters are becoming a huge part of the electorate here in Georgia that's like really becoming the make or break for a lot of these candidates. Okay. Uh, thank you both for coming. Laylee, my amazing yes. colleague. Hello. <laughs> how, thank you. <laughs> how did you handle covering a state in the national political spotlight? as you yourself were also thrust into the spotlight. And if you guys don't know, Laylee is one of the stars of Power oh Trip, which is a Hulu series. Um, and she's become a star within ABC and you know, still rising. So very, how did you kind. handle all of that and all the requests that you were getting and you know, the persona that is Laylee Ibsen now? That's so funny. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, it was hard like you know I, I won't be like oh my god it was the greatest experience of my life like it was it, i learned so much and um grew so much as a person but it definitely had its challenges i think that for me like coming from a local background really helped me because i always just really remembered why i was there and like yes i was covering a state for a network so what might be a big deal in my life might not rise to the level where it makes it on nightly news because you're competing with so many different storylines but there's still so many different avenues like in digital right and to like explain expand the context of your story we had several midterm embeds so it was like you know if i was working on a voting rights story maybe there was a voting rights story that was happening in arizona right and you you team up with different embeds and you kind of create a national story but it has so many different local aspects of it um which i thought was really cool so i i think it was like an interesting dynamic because there was always that like extra hurdle that i would have to take in order to pitch a story to the network when i like thought that there was like a there's a hospital that shut down in Atlanta and it was like a very big story because of course like you like it's what I think there's now no hospitals in metro Atlanta or one like there's, a trauma there's, there's no like there's only like two trauma tier like, right and then there's only like four in the state or something and like right. four hospitals have closed over the past like five years or something and so it's like so Georgia does not have a very does not have very strong healthcare infrastructure and when the other two hospitals are like Emory right. and Grady. It's right. like the, this very high level research hospital that like doesn't cater to the people of Atlanta who especially like lower people income of color people. and yeah, you talk about so. crime in Atlanta and you talk about traffic. Right. But it's also the fact that like if you're in an accident and like if you're stuck in rush hour traffic in order to like get to, you know, what I mean, it's so, like there are stories that are like really dynamic in your state, but like you know pitching it to the network like you got to take that extra hurdle and like talking to other embeds in different states is something that i would do or like ways in which that candidates were using that storyline stacy abrams like went in front of the hospital before it shut down things like that um for the show i mean like i don't know how many if it's if people have shows that are following them but i don't know i i think that i thought it was an interesting and unique experience because it was a way to kind of show other people how we were doing our work. And I think that even now when we talk about journalism um, and, you know, there's a rhetoric of fake news and like, how do you get from like point A to point B? I think being able to show people of like, OK, so here's how I start my day. Here's how like I'm boots on the ground, like following every single candidate that I can. And like this is like, oh, this candidate said something like, you know, Herschel Walker said something like this. And like, that's why it's a big deal. You know what I mean? Just like from people see the end product and for so many people they don't know how that sausage was made so being able to show how the sausage was made was a really cool experience um very kind though arthur 
Now I'm going to show off Matt as my very wonderful yes. colleague. <laughs> Hi. Uh, no, I have a question about like the intersection of what you guys do and like local media because I know we we've talked and written about how like all of the outlets are kind of being mined and like all the money's being pulled away from them by like all these corporate owners. Yeah. And so I know that you know the AJZ like that's what we mainly use uh, the post when we like want to understand things better. Um, but how is that uh, for you guys? You know, coming into the state, I know that Matt, you're from there. But, um, you know, covering um, a state for something for a bigger national outlet, but also not trying to, like, maybe overstep with the local media or collaborate with the local media or try to, like, elevate what the local media has been covering forever. And that's part one. And part two is, do you think a lot of those um, issues that we're having with voter rights and, and, and what's happening in the state legislatures, like, how do you think that the, like, stripping down of resources from local media has um, accelerated that? So I guess first I will say, um, in the grand scheme of American local media, I do actually think that Atlanta in particular, Georgia Georgia generally, but Atlanta in particular, actually has one of the more robust media markets. So we have like five local TV stations that are all actually pretty well staffed. Yep. Like the AJC is, you know, a, a well staffed paper that's part of a company that cares about journalism and stuff. So so they are they are under a lot of pressure but but when i look at it atlanta's not a news desert is what i'm saying which is actually why i feel like you will hear politicians in georgia say like oh my god and then the atlanta media is coming right and like, you know because they right. actually can do, yes. do, do some of that watchdog work still actually so um i will say i will say that for um a lot of folks i will also say that you know when we started coming down here like you know like us um you know other colleagues who are places like the times and, and other papers nationally that would come down to georgia i did talk to a lot of local reporters who were like oh lord right, like, right. nationals are coming they're like they're 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 interested again so um and they're and they're not they're not leaving this time right. they're, like, they're living here <laughs> but um so i will say that for um how to interact with them what storylines I, when I would look and try and figure out okay well what are the stories that we can be telling in georgia that are most of interest and of use to a national audience. It is usually not just the questions and stories that either might matter, I mean, quite frankly, just as someone from Atlanta, like to me personally or to um, idiosyncratically in the state, but what is something that can actually be extrapolated. It's not just the craziest thing. Yeah. It's like what can be extrapolated or understood in a broader context. That's at least how we approach it at the Post. Like the story of, um, you know, threats to election workers and the politicization of election machinery is something that you can see in a lot of different parts of the country. And I think that the interesting part for us was that it, while in a place like Arizona, for instance, the, there's a particular, you know, Arizona-ness to, to some of those debates that happen yep. there in Georgia, um, you know, a lot of these like questions over voter ID and who has access to the ballot, um, like we even in the recent past, like I remember growing up, there were like massive debates in like 2004 over this, you know, so so those types of questions, you need to make sure that it's something that other people in other places can understand as opposed to just saying, you know, I I'm just going to write this local story and then it's going to appear in a national outlet just because mm -hmm. I want it to. Like, that's not necessarily how it goes. I would also say that there are not to necessarily stories that are just like eye popping, but there are a lot of stories that just by being on the ground, a lot of people actually who are in the community might not realize the importance of the story that's happening to them. And I think that goes for local media and for the local people who live there, where if you really just like come in with some fresh eyes, like, you know, I'd been, you know, up in you know, up in the Northeast right. and then up in DC and just like coming back and saying like, wait, y'all, what happened? And then just like writing that story mm -hmm. that suddenly everyone realizes like, oh my God, like, you know, like this actually was a big story and we were all just, we, we all just took it for granted. So I think that that was kind of a thing to realize that while, especially on like the election administration beat, there's just like, like a million little minutia things that might be going on this way and that, that everyone here is super concerned about. But in the same way that every little minutia thing that happens in DC, no one's going to remember in 24 hours, there's a lot of that in local media. And I think that as a national person covering a place that is for a national audience, you need to be really disciplined about ignoring all of the little minutia that everyone's obsessed with and really right. realizing what is the story that really is going to resonate with everyone everywhere, either because they can relate to it or because it's something that is genuinely unusual, even like because, you know, everyone has weird minutia. The question is, like, what is what is going to rise to the national stage platform? Yeah, totally. I think also like local reporters really respect like 
when you as a national, like when I went down to Georgia, like I connected with all the local reporters and I was like, haha, like I'm from the network, I'm from DC. Like you make the joke and you kind of like break that barrier of like, I, there's an understanding that like you've been boots on the ground or like you've lived here. Like I can say like I'm being embedded in the state, but there's an end date for me right where I leave. And like for so many of the local reporters who live there, right, who vote there, right, it, it, it matters to them. And like the laws that we're talking about, the candidates that we're talking about, there's also like an even deeper personal connection to them. But I think that they're a really great resource when you're able to kind of connect to them in a way that's like, I understand that like you're the local reporter, I would love to use you as a resource and as a source. And if I can ever be helpful, like let me know, right? And just like, because you see them all the time, right? When you're on the campaign trail, like you're gonna see these people all the time or like you might've seen their work, right? Like acknowledging the work that they've done in the local B and like if that story has risen to a national level of like that's really cool right is like because a lot of those local reporters have a lot of really good sources especially with like advanced people or lo just like local like local leaders and you know that can really help you and your reporting that they're willing to share like if you're respectful to them and there's an understanding of what they've done as well thanks both of you for being here. I'm gonna actually, that's a nice segue to my question. Um, Matt, you are from Georgia, but you were reporting there and building a new beat there. And Laylee, you were from the South, but in embedding in Georgia for the first time. Can you speak to um, building a state source network? Yeah, um, like kind of just what I was saying is like, it kind of goes the general advice with sourcing is just um listen more than like you're actually like talking to people because i think that like when i went down there like yes of course like i meet with the campaigns right i meet with the state party leaders but then i meet with you know like the local voting rights groups right i meet with the local churches because uh church is so crucial you know you talk about souls to the polls like that is so big in georgia right like talking with religious leaders you just like finding people in the community that don't necessarily have a direct involvement with politics is like I think like that's how I really like was really helpful for me in terms of sourcing because th in a way there's going to be so many of uh, people that are like outside of politics that get pulled into politics when it comes to working on the campaign and the just like the uniqueness of Georgia of like politics is like embedded everywhere so yeah and I also just think that like going to places like outside of rallies and just like going to, you know, as weird as it sounds like the local Waffle House and like sitting at the diner and talking to people and just like asking people about their lives. And again, like talking to people that like and giving them a reason to talk to you without asking them political questions like where did you grow up like how did you feel about the 2020 election like, you know, these election laws, maybe they don't have a a direct answer and they don't think about it in their day-to-day -day lives but in some shape or form like they're going to be able to talk to you about how they feel about whether it's the political spotlight on georgia or just about democracy in general um so yeah just like talking to people like a, a regular person and not as a journalist sometimes or like for people that are in tv like it can be hard because you're like oh like this show needs to get mos but like talking to people without the camera and then if they're really good like getting their contact or like asking them pulling them over like afterwards like hey can i talk to you because i think that a lot of times like when you have this big camera and like this mic like people don't want to talk to you or they have more to share with you and that like you turn the camera off and they like start spilling to you and you're like wow this is great stuff like maybe i couldn't get it on camera and it can't air but like that knowledge that you have is just like really important in your reporting that you can use in other ways yeah i would i would co-sign all of that cool. um as a, as a print as a printer i guess what is what is a newspaper anymore? But um, but as a um, we don't have cameras, but we but whenever you start to bring up the audio recorder, right. Right, it does it it completely changes the dynamic. So I guess my first just piece of advice for sources, normal people, politicos, campaigns, just be normal and actually engage with people as as people. Um, and then I would also my second piece of advice would just be show up. Like there's a million little weird yeah. events that when you are especially outside of a place where everyone is incredibly media trained, Every, all of the politicos know exactly what they're supposed to say, everyone mm -hmm. has their talking points. Like 
that's the that was like kind of the the liberating thing about being on the ground where it's like this is a you know the director of this county or this is a person who is a state legislator and they just they just will talk off the cuff and like yeah. if you actually just show up to the events that they're at if you show up to the state election board meetings the county election meetings um if you go to the you know just random you know county fairs and fish rides yeah. and stuff it, like people will open up to you they'll see you as genuine because you're not just parachuting in it like when obama's in town and like oh well that's obviously everyone wants to like everyone's going to be there all the cameras are going to be there and it's like oh well they don't see that as like well you're just you're just here just to like quote me on this one thing and everyone's right. on their best behavior but like if you are there in a, it's a presence basically and if you're if you're there in those like very like real normal moments for people they'll both open up to you um, more and then actually be willing to like share more information with you I think so it's it's really just about even though you've got your pressures from you know national editors saying like this is where we need the story to be and like this is how grandiose it needs to be like you also need to balance that with being I need to be a person here and I need to yeah. be present because that's how you earn the trust of the people who will then get you that big national story. Mm -hmm. So thank you both for being here. Um, my question, I guess it's obviously after what happened in 2020 uh, with Trump and the Secretary of State, um, all eyes went to the braces for the Secretary of State yeah. across the nation in every state. Um, you guys were both based in Georgia, definitely. Um, and all eyes after specifically that incident in 2020, um, you know, it was like, Secretary of State of Georgia and all of that did when you guys when when both of you were talking to you know to to people in in residents in Georgia did they um also open their eyes and sit and, and actually realize you know how important it is you know to have um you know the, the relevance of having a Secretary of State some sometimes there are a lot of people who take for granted that race or we only focus on like um, representatives, senators, um, what was your understanding from the from residents in Georgia regarding the Secretary of State race? Mr. Secretary of State moderator. <laughs> Definitely. So um, I would say that I think the Secretary of State race in Georgia was really interesting because when you actually went to the Raffensperger and BWIN events, they were, you know, very, very focused on policy, um, actually because Raffensperger had done what he did and had made so clear that he is not an election denier. So I think that when I would talk to people in general about it, what was at stake in that race, though, wasn't necessarily how many business licenses is the Secretary of State going to be put out and, oh, I didn't even know that this person oversees election policy in this way. but. Really, you know, from Raffensperger supporters and B supporters, I heard a lot of questions of, well, what type of democracy do we want to be? Like, yeah. it shouldn't be the the base line that we are going to have um, questions over. You know, are you going to accept the election results as 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 the baseline? Which I think a lot of Georgia voters were, you know, grateful for and happy for. Um, I also think that um, when I talked to supporters of B and Democrats more broadly. Um, there was a lot of questions over wanting, you know, an affirmative secretary of state and like a very and a, a secretary of state who will, you know, go out there and do everything they can for voter registration and that they saw that in B. I think that she also, um, you know, just as, as um, one of the first major Asian American candidates on the ballot, um, that was a in really interesting sub sub story in, in the campaign because um, Georgia is diversifying in a lot of different ways, um, yeah. and Asian Americans are a very, you know, significant and important portion of the electorate in Georgia. I think actually it's now. I heard I, th I heard a stat from actually a local reporter that apparently Georgia now has the second highest number of AAPI lawmakers in the state legislature yeah. in the country, second only to Hawaii. Which I was like, wow. So like so so that story of like you know Asian American political mobilization was something that I thought was you know also very much tied to to B's campaign, and then with Raffensperger. Um, you know, engaging with his people, you know, talking about the fact that he has become this national star. He's he's gotten a lot of moderate um, and bipartisan, you know, consensus around him as kind of like, you know, what a conservative election director should be in the post-Trump era. I think that people were very aware of that and they were willing to reward him for it in ways that I don't necessarily... 
I think that it was interesting watching the way that he, you know, tiptoed around that. Like I asked him at the debate, for instance, um, you, your own office has said that there were no, that there was no evidence that, um, non-citizens voted in the, in any Georgia elections over the past four, four to six years, but you campaigned in the primary on, um, you know, cracking down on non-citizen voting right. and making this impossible. So, um, you know, questions on how he was able to navigate away from the base and, and placate people to his right to make peace with him, but then also how he was still able to, you know, maintain the broad, um, you know, coalition that then he was, that then he built and actually won, I think he won by almost 10 points, yeah. basically. So he, he won by the highest number of anyone in the state um, of statewide races. So I think that people were aware of it in long story short, but the questions that people were asking were refreshingly nuanced to me, mm -hmm. as opposed to the governor's race and the Senate race, and were also questions that i think got a lot more to like the local story in georgia at the time but so exactly for that reason that people were engaged but it wasn't necessarily in like a like it was it was also very just subsumed in a lot of ways to like the abrams race to right the, to the right Lamont race yeah yeah that's what i was gonna say so much of the secretary of state and most of the other local races was tied to the governor's race like you would go to a stacy abrams campaign event and like the rest of the democratic statewide ticket you know would be campaigning with her so it was more i think that they were like creating themes in terms of like the Democrats and Republicans and what they stand for in terms of ideals. And so, I th you know, B would always say on the campaign trail, like, we shouldn't be giving out, like, gold stars just because, like, someone's not going to overturn, you know, Democratic principles, right? So it was this, like, she was trying to create this argument of, like, we shouldn't be giving him credit for doing what he's supposed to be doing. Like what Matt was saying is like, like B was trying to say like he did the bare minimum. Like he he didn't engage with Trump's like efforts to try to overturn the election, right? Um, and I think that was a lot harder for her to make that argument to moderates and independents and like, you know, like the split ticket voters that were so crucial because it was for them, for Raffensperger and also for Kemp, there, there was a level of, okay, and Kemp would always say this, like, you might not agree with me on everything, but I tell you who I am, right? Like no one person's going to agree with their governor a hundred percent of the time. But like, I'm and the same with Raffensperger. I'm an honest person. Like I care about the constitution, right? Like I care about Georgians. I care about this state like it is what it is and for Georgians who had experienced so much of this national attention and fallout and politics like overwhelm them on the airwaves like you you can't go listen to the radio station you can't watch tv without seeing a political ad like normal was nice for them right like I think what we saw with especially like Abrams right is like these big bold ideas like might be nice and people might believe in them but like can they pass like in a Republican controlled state legislature? Probably not. And it's going to create like a lot of like back and forth if you have like a Democratic governor and like a Republican controlled, like, you know, majority in the state legislature. And so I think that for a lot of voters that I talked to, it was just like, well, Raffensperger is good because he stood up to Trump and like, you know, yeah, maybe like those election laws, like I didn't really like, but I'm really looking at the governor, right, to like protect me or like I could still vote and like maybe there were hurdles but like you know there are just different things that I think that like people understood who Raffensperger was they felt comfortable with him and like I think that's why we were like I you know there was a good chance that he was going to win but to see the margins that he won by I think that really went down to like you know same with Kemp of that like stick up to Trump and you know the ability for Georgians to recognize that and then in turn you know reward that you guys are both so insanely knowledgeable in this area and so thank you so much for sharing some thank of that you. with us today